The county of Yorkshire in the north of England, sparse, treeless countryside with extensive moorland areas and a few scattered farms in the valleys. Here, far from the mainstream of the world, the most famous trio in world literature lived, suffered and died, the Bronte sisters. The modest parsonage in the little town of Haworth, right behind St. Michael's Church and on the ground of the church cemetery, became the home of the Bronte family in 1820 and remained so for 40 years. The last member of the family of eight, the father, was carried to his final resting place in 1861. In July 1848, two young women got into a train in the nearby town of Kifri. Their destination is London. Charlotte, whose Jane Eyre had been the previous year's best-selling novel, and her younger sister Anne, the author of Agnes Grey, are determined to visit their publisher in the faraway capital. Emily Jane, the third sister, whose Wuthering Heights had caused a considerable scandal, does not like traveling and stays at home. At this stage, not even their closest friends know that the sisters are the authors of these books. The Reverend Bronte's daughters published their works under the names of Cara, Alice and Acton Bell. The press assumes that one person is behind all three pseudonyms, probably a man, as which woman would write books of such grossness? Even their publisher, George Smith, doesn't know who wrote the novels until two young women appear in his office unannounced. The Reverend Patrick Bronte covers no less than 40 miles each day in order to provide spiritual support and social help for his parishioners who live scattered throughout the countryside. The desolate countryside influenced the gruff and somewhat hostile people in the villages and isolated farmsteads around Haworth. They appreciated Reverend Bronte first and foremost because he kept himself to himself and didn't interfere with them. Who was this man? He came from the poorest of backgrounds and single-mindedly and with unbelievable energy had achieved a respected position, that of a permanent curacy. This meant a considerable stipend of 180 pounds per year, not a fortune, but a great deal more than most people had in those days. He was also given a parsonage to live in. He came from Ireland, where he grew up as the eldest of ten brothers and sisters. He began work in a weaving mill at the age of 13, but he wanted more than that. He learned to read and write and began to teach a Sunday school class at the age of 16. Rich patrons enabled him to study theology at the venerable University of Cambridge. After two years, he left the university with a degree and having changed his name. Prunty sounded too common and too Irish. He went through a hard period being a curate on a minimal stipend. Despite his Methodist leanings towards strictness and discipline, he always found time to express his love of nature and his joie de vivre in poems, which he also managed to get published. An unusual man of unusual character. At the end of his life, he admitted to Mrs. Gaskell, Charlotte's friend and the author of the first biography of Charlotte Bronte, if I had not been somewhat eccentric, I would probably not have had the children that I ultimately did have. In spite of this, Elizabeth Gaskell presented him as a male monster in order to give the lives of the sisters an almost sacred aura. Many of the myths of the sad lives of the Bronte children, which people like so much, come from her pen and are repeated again and again. The old man didn't defend himself against the image of himself thus presented as he was the one who had asked Mrs. Gaskell to create a monument to his daughters. His strong, passionate Irish nature was, in general, compressed down with resolute stoicism. But it was there, notwithstanding all his philosophic calm and dignity of demeanour. He did not speak when he was annoyed or displeased, but worked off his volcanic wrath by firing pistols out of the back door in rapid succession. Mrs. Bronte, lying in bed upstairs, would hear the quick explosions 
and know that something had gone wrong. But her sweet nature thought invariably of the bright side, and she would say, Ought I not be thankful that he never gave me an angry word? Now and then his anger took a different form, but still was speechless. Once he got the hearthrug, and stuffing it up the grate, deliberately set it on fire, and remained in the room in spite of the stench, until it had smouldered and shriveled away into uselessness. Another time, he took some chairs and sawed away at the backs till they were reduced to the condition of stools. Even the stories that Mrs Gaskell told that were true about pra Patrick Bronte actually had a perfectly sensible reason behind them. One of her most famous ones is the fact that Patrick used to fire a pistol out of the window every morning as though he was in a fit of violent temper. The reason for this was that the Brontes lived in violent times and parsons, like in an isolated parsonage like this one, were often victims of that violence. So he kept a loaded pistol in the house with children running around during the day. It wasn't safe to leave them there. So he would always shoot the pistol out of the window in the morning so that the bullet no longer remained in it. After the early death of his wife from cancer, Reverend Bronte found himself a widower with six small children. The youngest, Anne, was just a year old. His unmarried sister-in-law, Elizabeth Branwell, came from faraway Cornwall to take over the management of the household. Reverend Bronte, for his part, occupied himself with the upbringing and education of his daughters and his only son. He soon realized that his children had unusual gifts and considerable knowledge. They had unrestricted access to his library and to the many newspapers in the passage. He used the trick to find out more about his offspring's feelings, thoughts and knowledge. They would reveal more of themselves and speak more freely with a mask. What would a child like Ambrose want? If you experience either, that is what I would want. What do you think I should do with your brother Bramwell, for he can sometimes be a naughty boy? Reason with him, Father, and when he won't listen to reason, with him. Now, Bramwell, what is the best way of knowing the difference between the intellects of men and women? By considering the difference between them as to their bodies. Now for you, Charlotte. What is the best book in the world? The Bible. And the next best? The Book of Nature. And you, Elizabeth, tell me, what is the best way of educating women? That she shall run her house well. Mariah, what is the best way of spending time? By laying it out and preparing for a happy eternity. The daughters of clergymen with small stipends were in a social quandary. Of course, they were the daughters of gentlemen, but without dowries and education for a profession, they were almost worse off than serving maids. <laughs> 